So, um, the subtitle that I've attached to this is the context and the moment. So actually quite a bit of what you're going to hear is this election in the context of the last um, three or four decades of the Canadian party system. It's undergone really very substantial changes. And much of what we thought we knew um, seeks to be true, some of it 25 years ago, some of it 15 years ago. Uh, and uh, so part of it is to kind of rearrange your expectations of the moment uh, by taking into account changes in the very nature of the, of the Canadian party system. So uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to have this focus on context here. First of all, um, in as much as not everybody here is Canadian, uh, let me give you a, just a tiny primer on institutional basics. Uh, the Canadian system is a classic version of the Westminster system. Arguably, in fact, it is now the most archaic version of the Westminster system. Even in the UK now, uh, between changes to the rules governing dissolution of parliament and the recent decision by the, the Supreme Court in the UK about the uh, prerogative in relation to prorogation, the UK is now actually being, to a certain extent, self-restricted, uh, but there's some sense in which there, there have been much more uh, severe constraints placed on the strategic advantages that accrue to the governing party. So we have a pretty simple, as far as federal elections are concerned, low detail Westminster system. The right to govern, the moral right to govern, rests on the ability to control continuing majorities in the House of Commons, the so-called competence chamber. But what it means to enjoy confidence is an open question uh, in many respects, somewhat up to the discretion of the government. But that's a very important consideration if, as uh, current polls suggest, it will be a hung parliament, no single party will be a majority, and a whole set of rather open, only partly covered by convention issues will accrue. So the makeup of the House, obviously, is, is very important. Uh, and then we have an electoral system that is, as in the UK um, and in India, untouched by innovation since well, the Middle Ages. Uh, well, that's not true. Since 1885. <laughs> we now at least have single member districts. We don't have county members and borough members and all of that. But we, what we have is a sometimes called first past the post. But the essential thing is single member districts right, in, in the proportional representation systems of the world. You have multi-member districts, in some cases the whole country is the district, but in any case, multi-member districts. Here it's single-member districts, and the other important thing is that the formula by which uh, uh, the identification of the winner is made is, is the plurality formula, as distinct e.g. from Australia, which has a majority formula using that preferential ballot. It's the plurality formula, where plurality means more votes than any other single candidate, it's thus possible to win a seat with as few as typically 25 to 30% of the vote. And I, I don't doubt that there will be some seats in BC decided by such margins. The winner might get 29% and the third place party might get 25%, that sort of thing. So that's the, that's the institutional basics. If you want to, if you want to uh, pound the table about the uh, deceptive simplicity or the disproportionate all of that, that's fine. But that's, what we're, that's the system we're working with and we'll still be working with it after Monday. So that's, that's the most institutional basic. I'm going to tell, tell a bit of a story about dynamics, mostly about dynamics within campaigns, or a little bit about between elections. There's going to be a little bit of history in here, including the history of dynamics, because in fact, the various things to do with the way in which the parties compete and the kind of positions they take on policy have implications for how much movement you might actually expect to see in elections. There's going to be something about geography and the electoral system. That's terribly important. And one of the <clears throat> one of the difficulties when you give talks about Canadian elections to non-Canadian audiences, you have to spend a lot of time on geography because geography is peculiarly important in this country. As Mackenzie King once said, we have too much of it. But we also have to, we have too much of it structured in particular ways. So for example, if you think of the country most like us, the one that first comes to mind assume it would be Australia, continental size, similar populations, and so on. But Australia, in some sense, couldn't be more different from us. Everybody lives in cities, all the cities are in the same time zone, every state is fundamentally the same as every other state, maybe Western Australia is here, forgive me for saying that, but fundamentally that's the case. And Australian politics incorporates state and federal politics all the same way, there's not much discretion, and you would start talking about Australian politics by talking about class. 
just as you would historically in the UK. Whereas here, we have to start talking about geography. This is a place where some, uh, where, where the metropolis for certain provinces is in other provinces. This is a country in which some provinces, in effect, were creatures of federal government, where other provinces predate the, the very use of the word Canada. So it's a, the geographic heterogeneity of the place is an absolutely front rank consideration. And in some of the pictures that I'll show you, um, geography will have pride of place. And that includes the geography and dynamics, because some parts of the country have more electoral flux available to them than others do. Uh, but uh, there's, running through the whole thing are a couple of themes. One, the Canadian party system has polarized. Time may not permit me to give you some polarization evidence, but I, I just will assert at the top that it has become more polarized. We don't think of the Canadian system as historically polarized. We think of the Liberals and Conservatives in particular, as kind of circled on the Tweedledee, historically differentiated not by substantive questions of taxation redistribution of the ordinary stuff of politics. If you actually ask of the 20th century, what was the major basis of differentiation? The answer was the British Empire and the Commonwealth and a, a fundamental disagreement over Canada's place in it. That's history. Uh, as, the, as, as the parties have kind of moved off uh, polarization over that particular old identity question, They've come to differ with each other in ways that map more directly onto current policy considerations. And the policy stakes now of accountability, if you understand what I just said, I'll expand on it, but the policy stakes now are much higher than before. So if you're of a mood to punish an incumbent prime minister to express your anger, outrage, or mere disappointment, you have to ask yourself, am I prepared to bear the policy burden of doing so? Uh, and the answer would have been easier 30, 40, 50 years ago than it is now. Uh, but the other thing is that the, the system pre presents what I'll call coordination of challenges. The picture of elections that I'm going to present to you is, is, a, is a matter of elections as uh, occasions for mass coordination. We may think about what our preferences are. We may observe a number of alternatives of varying degrees of acceptability to us. But at the end of the day, the, the impact of our own vote will depend on how, by whatever magic, our votes and the votes of other people are coordinated. And uh, I'll come back to that repeatedly. So just to just a start, though, here's the, here's the path of preferences, trial heats. If an election were held today, what party would you vote for? From the 2015 election down virtually to the present day, there's not a lot of detail on the present moment, but I wanted to just get you to look at the big one. So in case you're wondering, um, you know, so 39.6 out there, that, that little text, that's what the Liberal Party got in the last election. That's what gave them their majority in Parliament. The majority in Parliament was not a particularly strong one, 14 seats more than the 170 threshold, but it was a, a majority nonetheless. And then they embarked upon one of the longest lasting, most pleasant honeymoons uh, in Canadian electoral history. It lasted for about a year, in fact. And then it evaporated quite quickly towards the end of 2016. The, the event or moment that seems most relevant, and I think it probably is the story, is the breaking of a promise on electoral reform, interestingly, given how important the electoral system is to this whole story. That even, even though there was no evidence that a majority of Canadians wanted electoral reform, uh, there was no real basis in popular sentiment for this, but it was an explicit promise made by Justin Trudeau early in the 2015 campaign. That 2015 would be the last election fought under the electoral system I just described to you, the one you know, going back to the Middle Ages and all that. And of course, he broke the promise. He broke it straight up. There's nothing more you can say than that he broke the promise. And that seems to have also broken the honeymoon. Uh, and I have been arguing for some time that actually he lost, he, he then said about losing his majority over basically 2017. The notion that the Liberal Party went into this campaign, or even went into the beginning of this year, pre SNC Madeline, whatever that term of art means to you, but anyway, the notion that there was some sort of some liberal majority that was kind of a presumptive outcome of an electoral held that has not been true since sometime in 2017, in my view. Not only did the Liberals embark upon a kind of gradual slide over 2017, but the Conservatives, as they sorted themselves out and got a leader, uh, began a gradual rise. That we should understand that this country is not, this country was not uniform 
in its approval of Justin Trudeau and the package of broadly conceived progressive policies that he tries to identify himself with. There are plenty of Canadians who were never on side with that project from the beginning, and their numbers started growing in 2017, as expressed in the rising blue line for the Conservatives. Uh, and then it's been a kind of back and forth, but you know, this fool here. Gotta love Green College, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Class. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's been sort of back and forth, starting around the beginning of 2018, which I shudder to think is almost two years ago. 2018 is almost two years ago. So um, this this may be this dip in the red that may be the visit to India. The timing is about right. Although it's also true that this is the spring of the. Um, Revisions to income tax, uh, which uh, basically you know, do income sprinkling in, uh, in unincorporated businesses and that sort of thing, which was a which was a policy fiasco. But then again, by the time we hit the middle of 2018, the liberals are kind of back on top. But honestly, not by enough to have a majority. If you ask me, this dip, um, these things are these kind of non-parametric smoothers. They tend to make things look smoother than they really are. And, and the story really is here. This is SNC Lava, which put the, put the liberals seriously behind the conservatives. Uh, and so, some of equal measure, conservative rise, liberal loss, although it also empowered the Greens. You know, part of the story of the Greens being a factor, potentially, and a matter of discussion is actually, isn't so much about people magically becoming green between here and here, but rather that the Greens clearly are some sort of alternative to the liberals, uh, liberals without visible minorities, I would say. Uh, but uh, then they've been coming back, but only to know better than something like level picking. So I'll get, we'll get into a little bit more detail on where we are now. But <coughs> this election, I'll just say, has been threatening to be close for months. It's not a new thing, and it's not a sin. This is kind of universal popularity for the liberals that Justin Trudeau, by his own actions, how merits to discipline. Well, his actions are actually pretty important. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> so we're now we're now into the campaign, and here's a here's a fact that should make any liberal worry. But this is I, what I've done here is I've basically uh, I've I've basically again run one of these smoothers, so I won't bore you with the details of the smoothers. But they're they're trying to find a. It's, a, it's what's called something called a spline. It's trying to find its way through a body of data without strong priors, right? So we're not trying to we're not trying to fit some theoretical model here. We're trying to we're just trying to burn off the noise and find a reasonable representation of the signal inside the noise. And averaged across public opinion polling from 1953 to 2015, this is sort of what happens in the sense that. Um, incumbents lose ground. So I, first of all, I set it at 70 days before the election. 70 is kind of the outer margin of Canadian campaigns. Most of them are much shorter than that. But we've we've actually had some longish campaigns for various reasons. The 2015 campaign was 72 days. Um, uh, if, if you may recall, the, Mr. Harper asked for a solution at the very beginning of August for an election that took place in late October. That was the second longest campaign in Canadian history. The only longer one being 1872, a whole different world of horses and buggies and real hustings and bribery and trading and violence at the front of the hustings and all sorts of stuff that you would bear thinking of now. Uh, and and um, the, so the red periods vary from anywhere from sort of 40 days to 70 days, with sort of the mid 40s being the standard period for most of this period. And so I just wanted to have a reasonably inclusive representation of potential campaigns. And in terms of where we are now, this would take us back to roughly the middle of August. And I'll show you some pictures later on where we go from the middle of August to the present. But the, the point being that in the last 40 days of most official writ periods, the governing party loses on average two or three percentage points. You should worry about that if you're a liberal. But on the other hand, the pattern may be changing. And this actually edges us towards the transformation of the party system. So if you have, this is hilarious, Mark. I love it. Anyway, if you look at this, so these, these are, again, attempts to come up with time paths 
of support for the party in power over those elections for which we have enough opinion poll evidence to say something about dynamics. And that basically starts with 1984, a kind of coming of age year for the polling business in Canada. Um, and um, so I won't dwell on too many details, so some of this room I can tell will remember this. This is, this is the liberal, post-liberal convention. John Turner replaces Pierre Trudeau. The selection process produces a bubble for the liberals. And with that in mind, Turner asks for dissolution, sends Bryce Maxey off to the Vatican, and away we go. And then we have a debate in which Brian Moore says, you have a choice. And uh, what we underestimate is that there was also a debate the night before in French, in which um, Brian Mulroney presented himself as Venetius de la Cocna. And everybody said, Chez nous, he's one of us. So there's also that going on here. But anyway, we can, we can go on this. But there's a story in which if you go through uh, these elections, much of that decline in the incumbent chair is a story of earlier years. Right? 1993 is the unraveling of the Conservative Party, going, going from being the government, uh, the only uh, party to have consecutive majorities uh, since the 1950s, and to having only two MPs with the rise of reform. Uh, so uh, you know, here's where uh, the party system actually changes its very fundamental character inside a campaign. But as we move into the 21st century, there's a lot less going on within campaigns, at least in relation to the incumbent. Okay? Um, the action moves somewhere else. And I'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. I'll just, and, uh, part of what I want to say here is that this is a surface symptom of the polarization of the party system. Um, that it's sort of in the battle as between liberals and conservatives, or I should say, between the right and the left. The gap between the right and the left has expanded. <clears throat> Another thing to note, though, is that the little red dots here are the actual shares in the election itself of the parties that were the parties of government in this period. And they're almost all above the polling line by a couple of percentage points. So if I remember, I'd take some reassurance from that. Um, so you know, it might be a reasonable expectation that whatever the numbers are as of Sunday, Maybe you want to add a couple of more. Oh, telephone, and isn't that a problem now that there's so many cell phone users that are almost none of these polls are with telephone. How are they done now? So, um, well, can we come back to that? Sure. I mean, the answer is the answer is it's not the cell phone problem. <coughs> the, the polls are done in a whole variety of different ways, and even the ones that are done on the phone often involve cell phones, and in fact, they all do. Uh, and there is there are some telephone technologies we can talk about because some firms use these, but but the rise of the cell phone ain't the particular problems with polls. The other problems with polls are the adaptations to them. But you know, I wouldn't represent these as prediction failures. They, they actually do. A, all of these ones have done a pretty good job of within the what, the, what they call the margin area of anticipating the result. Um, so, quick primer then on the transformation of the party system. So, the party system that um, I grew up with, many of us grew up with, um, is, is the old one, right? And the old one, the first thing you have to know is Quebec was the pivot, right? That the electorate of Quebec in federal elections was consolidated as, in the sense that it tended to go to one party, one party of potential government, and not the other, but no one. It could move. And, uh, uh, it was not, in fact, it was normal for a party uh, to win 80% of the seats in Quebec. That's 80% of 25%. So uh, the party that did that would be somewhere between 40 and 50% of the way to a single party majority before the rest of us did anything. Right? And most of the time, 80% of the time, from 1996 to 1984, this was the Liberal Party. This is part of the story of the Liberal Party being the dominant party in the system, one of the most successful political parties in the world, particularly in the world of um, the old Commonwealth and the US. Uh, so that was the most fundamental fact, that four times in five, the Liberals would get basically halfway to a majority just in Quebec. Uh, and, if, and if Quebec so much as withdrew below the 20% line, 
the liberals would lose. But it didn't happen often. The other, part, the other big story of the old system was that over the course of the 20th century, it became progressively a more multi-party system, which is not supposed to happen under first-past-the-post uh, electoral rules. They're supposed to favor the two frontrunners. Uh, but in fact, we had a multi-party system. And there's been two parts to that. So one part of these, one part of that, what I'm giving you is a book on the slide. The book was published two years ago. It's a sheer cure for insomnia. If you ask me about it, I'm happy to tell you. But anyway, one part of that is that there's been a kind of an insurgency pattern. Sudden insurgencies into the electoral framework. Similarly, sudden withdrawals. And over the course of the 20th century, these insurgencies came at the expense of, or then gave back to, the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party had a very volatile vote of the 20th century, and a lot of that volatility was in exchanges with these insurgents, who would come in and grab a share from the Conservatives, but then the Conservatives would then pull them all back into their tent every 30 years or so, form a government of overwhelming scale, which would proceed to fall apart the moment it was formed. Uh, the other story is the CCF, at NDP, Cooperative Commonwealth, Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, the CCF, that's the old uh, party of the left. It morphed into the NDP, uh, pretty much a full on party later in 1961. But between the two of them, but especially since the formation of the NDP, there's been secular growth. There have been reversals. But for the most part, it's been a slow upward trend at the expense of the liberals. Okay? Uh, and uh, starting in the West, but slowly spreading east. So if you think about the consequences of that underlying structure for election outcomes in this old system, what you have is most of the time the liberals would win, they'd win by enough, uh, they usually have a majority, not always, but every 30 years or so there would be a conservative boom or bust. <coughs> the conservatives would, would go from being an opposition, often a weak one, to having an overwhelming majority, and then they'd go back to where they started from. And usually they'd be worse off for the experience of government. <clears throat> Liberal domination, but a slide in the popular vote, mass by seats. And then you have this multi-partism, which with the growth of the NDP, and this is really important, as the NDP grew, the form that Canadian multi-partism increasingly took was within constituencies. It's not supposed to happen. Multi-partism, according to the theories, occurs when you get different parties in different regions. So you'll have two dominant parties in each region, but there'll be different pairs of dominant parties. And that was sort of true in the 30s, but as the CCF and NDP grew, spread, it became multi-party competition within individual constituencies in more and more parts of the country, but nowhere more than <coughs> in BC. And this is why, part of why BC is so important at this time. The number of parties within, the number of potentially viable parties within districts is a big part of the story of the volatility in seats that we might see for really quite small movements in the popular vote. And that goes back to this whole issue of coordination, of which there is no. 1993 ended that system, and then we embarked on the transition towards the one we have now. And so we had a decade or so of this transitional stuff. So the first thing that happened is, in some sense, in 1993, Quebec, having dominated the system, exited the system from the point of view of government formation. This is the year in which the Bloc Québécois broke through, and it stuck around for a decade as, a, as the, well, it stuck around. For more than a decade, it was the dominant party inside Quebec, which meant that the majority of seats in Quebec were, in some sense, taken out of the question of who gets to form the government. A very different story from before. And that meant that in some sense, now the game is being played in the rest of the country. That's one thing. 1993, the, the Canadian right blew up. That the, that the most anti-Quebec, anti-immigrant, and anti-state parts of the biggish tent of the old progressive conservatives fragmented off into this thing called reform. Reform was a little unclear precisely what it meant initially, but, but in due course, it became clear that this was actually a, a mechanism by which people with a more consistently and ideologically conservative view of what policy should be began a process of reorienting the Canadian right. Uh, although there's some, well, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, at the same time, the NDP had a moment of collapse, which meant that the liberals, in some sense, controlled the center and the left. 
The, the upshot of all of this is that you had 10 years of liberal governments with very strong majorities, 65% of Soviet seats in the House, and very fragmented opposition, but they got those majorities with about the same share of the popular vote as liberals got in the last election, 40% or so, plus or minus, gave them 65%. When you've got 65% of the seats in the House and the opposition is fragmented, you can do a lot of stuff like eliminate the deficit. That was a transition, however, and uh, what made that transition come about, in some sense, was this in 1993. This line here, you've seen it. That's the incumbent share, aka the progressive conservative share. That's the rise of reform. If you think in terms of a first-past-the-post electoral system, and you, and you sort of average these results across a bunch of constituencies, which is what's happening here, that's a political disaster for the Canadian right. Uh, and then this, this is just sort of playing it out, so that by the end of the decade, reform has clearly got the whip hand to try to coordinate the side of the spectrum. And what we know what happens in, in 20, 2003, reform, in effect, took over the Conservative Party. It was a reverse takeover, and the Conservative Party, by that name, now has a very strong reform cast to it, and its support is disproportionately in parts of the country where reform is strong in the West. So here we are now. Now the system, there's flux. I mean, you know, parties win and lose, but the pattern these days is that Quebec is sort of back in the game, but it's, it's it, the way in which Quebec is in the game now is it's highly mobile. It's not a one-sided uh, uh, liberal or conservative majority that makes it the kind of key veto player in the whole system. But it is potentially quite volatile, and it's been very volatile in the last month. So it's back in the game. All federal parties have been present in Quebec since the turn of the millennium, at least some of the time. The bloc has come and gone, seems to be coming back to roughly where it was 15 years ago. Multipartism still exists, but in contrast to the 90s, the coordination problem is on the center and the left. Um, and uh, the polarization expresses itself as an antipathy between the conservatives on one hand and the rest. We can talk about the People's Party if you like at the end. I think the critical thing about the People's Party is that although they're tapping into a body of sentiment inside the conservative coalition, which is very large, the most important thing at the moment is that the conservative party is out of power. We'll try again next time on the People's Party if the conservatives win. The consequence is, is that the Conservative Party, in some sense, is the most stable out of the landscape now. You see that in polls. They, they have a solid base, but it's also hard for them to grow. The Liberals are vulnerable on both flanks. People on the kind of center-right, many of whom do vote Liberal, are vulnerable to defections to the Conservative, and they're vulnerable to defections on the other side. And the, the locus of volatility, at least outside Quebec, is Liberals versus New Democrats. And that's what we're living in right now with the Greens as an interesting chorus as well. And so the, 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 the volatility that we're observing right now is a volatility within an electoral block, the, the center left. Um, I don't think I'm going to dwell on this. Like, just, just to make a point about polarization, and then I'll move on. Um, one expression of this, the, there's a... The, the policy difference between the parties have increased, various other things have increased, but if you just ask respondents to Canadian election surveys, on a scale of 0 to 100, where 100 means you like everything about the object, and 0 means you like nothing about it, and 50 means you can take it or leave it, but it's an expression of warmth or proximity, whatever, on this scale, how much do you like the Conservative Party? How much do you like the Liberal Party? Okay? What's happened is that the distribution of responses to that question has become much more dispersed. So if you go back to 1988, for example, this is the rest of Canada. So this is the Canada-US free trade election, a very high stakes election, Mulroney versus Turner and so on. Um, there's plenty of dispersion here. You know, so you, you can bet that uh, down here at the low end of the blue, those aren't conservatives who are saying they don't like the conservative party. They're liberals and the Democrats. And then uh, the, the, down the red here, those are not liberals, they're conservatives. 
But the distributions are kind of similar, they're kind of symmetric, they're kind of normal distributions. But as you move through the successive elections, here's where we are in 2015. This is the distribution of sentiment toward the Conservative Party across all respondents. And notice that the, there's this little mode here down close to zero, that this is telling us that there's a lot of people who really don't like the Conservative Party. There's actually a lot of people who don't like the Liberals and NDP as well, but this is a particularly striking thing, is that this, this Conservative small mode has been moving up and becoming more important. And it's particularly striking in Quebec. Um, anyway, uh, that, that's a token of polarization. I don't think I will say any more because I need to get on with it. And what's happened, though, once the right got its act back together and reform engineered the takeover of cons the Conservative Party, the Conservatives, for the time being at least, don't have a coordination issue. They have an issue perhaps in extending the reach of the coalition, but, the, but, but it's, if you're a conservatively minded person, it's clear who you have to vote for, at least it is right now. It's on the other side of the spectrum, and this is sort of how it's played out over the years um, between basically the Liberals and the NDP. I don't want to dwell on the great length, but basically if the Liberals go down, the NDP go up and vice versa. Don't need to dwell on that. Okay? And so now we're getting close to the present, and believe it or not, I'm actually getting close to the end of my talk. But anyway, we're getting closer to the question. So let's just sort of talk about what's happened since uh, the beginning of 2019. So this gets us into the uh, SNC Lavalin scandal and the, the um, ejection of Joey Wilson Rimble from the party, and all of that. <clears throat> um, but I'm now I also want to use this as a way to kind of introduce you to geography. Right? And so when you look at the national vote number, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the Conservatives are wasting votes on the prairies. Right? Who needs 70% of the vote to win the seat? Right? Um, and uh, uh, this represents uh, real gains by the Conservative Party. They, in Saskatchewan, they got about 45% last time, and only 25% in Manitoba. Given that the two provinces have the same number of seats and roughly the same population, this is telling us that Manitoba has rallied to Saskatchewan, basically. So the Liberals could lose every seat in those two provinces, and that's eight seats. Um, they had four seats in Alberta, they could well lose all four of them. So there's, my, my arithmetic is correct, there's 12 seats right there. Um, so although the Conservatives are wasting votes, they, they still might pick up a very useful 12 seats. Um, the, the Liberals have lost ground. They, they, they were maybe ahead before. They certainly lost ground under the SNC Lavalin. They've come back, but they're definitely behind, and now they're losing ground again. Um, they're, uh, they've usually been ahead in Ontario, but again, SNC Lavalin hurt, but they sort of come back. Thank you, Doug Ford. Uh, and then they have been ahead in Quebec until now, perhaps not anymore, but been ahead in Quebec. They, they were, are substantially ahead in Atlantic. So there's a sense in which the Liberals are competitive in a lot of places where, in one sense, you look out of one side of it, your head, and it's a very efficient distribution of the vote, a distribution that could enable them to win a lot of seats by modest margins, which is what they did in 2015. The flip side of that, however, is that they can lose a lot of the seats as well. And so um, they, their coalition is very much at risk. Some of that risk has come about through loss of votes on the right side of the party to, to the Conservatives. They, they don't lose as many votes to the Conservatives as they used to do because the gap has changed and the parties are different. But nonetheless, the right side of the liberal spectrum still has people who, who are not wedded to the party. But the other side, of course, is that they're losing to the left. Um, and this picture doesn't bring it out as clearly as it might because I've had to set the vertical scale to accommodate the full range of outcomes. And so Alberta, in particular, is buttering up the whole thing. <laughs> the real story is down there between 20 and 40 everywhere else, in some sense. So let's focus a little bit more. So what I've got here is a couple of slides in which, literally, I made these between 
3.30 and 4.45. I'd like to acknowledge Aaron Zand at the back of the room there. Who, he didn't make these pictures. He's not responsible for them. But he's the guy who's been grinding out the, uh, scraping the, the uh, poll data from the web and carefully not repeating stuff for which I would be served with, a, with some sort of criminal fine if I were repeating it. Because some of this stuff is propriety and they don't let you talk about it. Um, but uh, here we are. This is basically, go back to this magic number 70. So this is from kind of the middle of August. So this in some sense reproduces the maximum view of the length of a campaign. Okay? The, the rip period actually starts sort of somewhere in here, um, early September. So, um, you know, the, what, what are the patterns here? Well, the first thing is that both of the major parties are losing ground. So this is part of the confusion of the situation we face. Clearly, the, the liberals have lost ground. And they've, um, this, um, this slope here is probably close to that slope because it's got a bigger vertical scale for the liberals and for the conservatives. But the conservatives have lost ground. And here we have the block. I wouldn't pay any attention to that. The point, that's, a, that's a curve fitting problem. But here they are, the block. We're kind of rolling out along at about 20% of the vote, a little bit below what they've been doing in 2015 and 2011. And then we have basically the 10 day on debate. It, it brings uh, the leaders of varying degrees of Francophone mastery onto the stage. And it is the reintroduction of Law 21 onto the agenda. It had been sort of ignored and been a Hustings issue perhaps for the talk. But now it's on the screen. And everybody has to answer the question. And, it's the, and, and under the circumstances, part of what's going on here is that the overwhelming majority of Quebecers who support Law 21 see that here's the only party that cares enough that it will, without letter hindrance, do whatever it can to resist attempts to repeal it or to overcome it in the courts. So that's part of what's going on here. Uh, I don't think there's any particular suggestion of acceleration by the last debate. It's just been grinding away steadily as exposure to the question has increased. In Ontario, it is the NDP which has been the major beneficiary. Now, again, the vertical scales do not particularly align. I just, uh, but you've got both, both of the big parties losing ground with the NDP as a quite uh, considerable beneficiary. But it, can't even read it myself. The, the levels we're talking about here, I think that's a 20. The levels we're talking about here is kind of high teens, low points. And then BC, okay. um, again, very different vertical scale, so don't try to line them up the way I did another thing. I'm sorry about that, but I, I was in a hurry. And I, I wouldn't believe that. That's, I think, what we should be thinking about. The Conservative Party and the Liberal Party were largely level pegging three months ago. Both have been losing ground. Um, the Liberals have been losing ground a little bit more quickly. But again, and the, and the Greens basically are stuck in place. They, they, are not, they, they were stronger some months ago, but they're sort of, they now seem to be hanging in there at about 15 percentage points. And the NDP is the big beneficiary. And the fact is, and this is a point that I've, I've been at some pains to make, point I've been at some pains to make in sort of blogging that I do, PDP actually always comes back in elections. This is a bizarre thing, that, that there's always this defeatist, disappointed talk of leading the campaign. But on average, where the NDP is sort of solidly in third place and below its historic kind of numbers, it tends to converge on its historic numbers over the course of the campaign, gaining sort of two or three percentage points. So in some sense, part of what's going on here ain't so different <laughs> from previous years. This isn't just a meet saying running a really good campaign, though he is, uh, but it's also a, a, a return of a sort that we've seen in other years. And uh, let's also bear in mind that what he's doing is undoing a lot of the damage that he did. It's not like the NDP is cresting to historic levels in this province. They're moving back to where they were last time at 25% of the vote, which still only got them 10 seats. So it's still not 100% clear what this actually portends uh, for the result. Um, but uh, 
just a few <laughs> concluding thoughts and then I'll let you take over. So there's a similarity uh, in what we're, we're going through. The, the patterns that we're experiencing are not unique to 2015. <laughs> they in many ways build on a pattern that's been built up over decades. Uh, uh, and one part of that is government wins. It assembles a coalition which has marginal elements which may reflect not so much uh, assent ex ante to its policies, but just at the time to get rid of the other guy. And then the government proceeds to alienate bits and pieces of its governing coalition. And over the course of the next four years, those votes fall away and go somewhere. So that's some of what we're picking up here. The, let's also be clear that um, averaged across the country as a whole, at least, not so true within certain regions, but then there's, a, there's some statistical reasons why that is so. But we're not arguing over massive changes. I and mean, one thing I'm struck by, for example, is that polling firms or their uh, mouthpieces in the media are talking in decimal places. The liberals are at 33.1, and the conservatives are at 32.7. Oh, but by the way, the margin. And I find myself thinking, why? Why is anybody, why is anybody making anything of this? other than that this is a situation of remarkable uncertainty. But I think it's partly because there has been <coughs> so little motion that the degree of motion that we're observing now on the general principle that you have to have a man bites dog story to drive the news is that these tiny variations become headlines and much of the variation is noise, right? It's sampling error across successive, successive iterations of any given party's poll. It's what we call house effects. Uh, when we talk about the notion of total survey error, it's not just the sample. It's also the other things, the magic sauce that they sprinkle over their data, the way in which they ask their questions and so on. And what's, we don't actually have that many polling firms. What is more, in a return to an old way of doing things, the uh, individual polling firms are now tied to individual media outlets and vice versa. Right? So the Global Mail has Nick Nanos. Somebody else has Main Street, and, and so on. Um, and each of those polling firms, to anticipate coming back to a question from here, uh, different polling firms have different modes, telephone, interactive voice response, online panel, and so on. And often, what you're getting is not necessarily something that's actually happening in the electorate, but a switch from this day's poll, which was a telephone poll, to the next day's poll, which was a report from a online survey panel. So uh, by my calculation, for most of these things, if you plot, uh, if you try to extract rather the, the signal inside all that noise, something like 85% of the variation over uh, particularly the period from say mid-July to mid-September was noise. It was just all this kind of stuff that is of no consequence whatsoever in terms of what's actually going on. Now that's shifted in the last few weeks. There's some real movement going on. But even there, it's really quite modest, right? Really understand this. Its significance, however, is that only modest shifts, rather modest shifts, can make in the vote can produce dramatic shifts in the seats, but in ways that are not easy to predict, given the fractionalization of the vote and the number of parties in play in certain places, and especially in this province. Uh, so. Um, it remains true, I didn't dwell on this, but one of the implications of the regional uh, map that I put up earlier is that voting power outside Quebec is focused in ethnically diverse suburban ridings in Toronto and Vancouver in particular. Right? So why are, the, why are the leaders here so much? Well, they're here because, not because British Columbians are peculiarly volatile in their behavior, <coughs> but because a large number of ridings, essentially in the lower mainland, and really kind of eastern and southern suburbs, have such narrow margins amongst the parties, and typically amongst three parties, I shouldn't say typically, amongst three parties in some of them, and amongst two parties in others, but amongst parties, the margins are so narrow that, that if you think of campaigning as an investment proposition, how much, how, many, how much resources are you investing in, in a constituency? What's the possible return from that investment? You're going to overinvest in these competitive districts. And Vancouver is seemingly well endowed with them. So that's part of the story. And by the way, that is an important factor in why, um, notwithstanding very deep differences 
on these uh, on opinions on these questions and their bases over immigration, multiculturalism, uh, identity politics. Even though, for example, people who identify with the Conservative Party of Canada are wait for it indistinguishable from Republicans. The party leaders don't play those cards. At least they don't play them overtly. That that Andrew Scheer and Justin Trudeau need those constituencies, as does Jagmeet Singh, they need those constituencies, and those constituencies being ethnically very diverse in some sense are the, in a way, the new Quebec, except that they're not one-sided, quite the opposite. Uh, but Quebec is back, um, and uh, all this talk about coalition, liberals and New Democrats, honestly, if there's any party that's actually going to be in a position to whatever it means to say this, hold the balance of power, it will be the Bloc Québécois. If there's any one party which comes close to or exceeds the threshold by itself of being able to, to determine who shall govern, it'll be the Bloc. It won't be the NDP. So think about that. <clears throat> um, so how many Bloc members are I don't have a real forecast here, but the, they could have 40. They could have 50. I mean, you know, 50 is sort of what they had three years ago. Um, and uh, the final point that and this is, I think, is what a lot of people want to talk about and have on their minds is that the coordination issue in this election, as it is in so many elections, is on the left. And so, good luck to all of us as we try to figure out what to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm finished. <laughs> coordination on the left.